right, thank you. Thank you. All right. Following Regina is always a, a tough act. Um, uh, it's particularly tough uh, when you know, you're talking about something that is really only in kind of its earliest stages. Um, and it's then even tougher uh, if, if uh, you know, that concept that you're trying to convey um, doesn't even really have a name quite yet. And so you had to make one up on the fly, uh, which is bioprology. Um, and that's what I'll uh, try to uh, kind of convey uh, for the remainder of this talk. Um, a disclaimer, like uh, you just heard, um, this is, you know, I'm a total bio newbie. Uh, this is my very first foray into this field. Uh, I really, really don't have any idea about it. Um, we're 10 months in, give or take. We actually, um, you know, started in earnest maybe only eight months ago. Um, so just, you know, just keep that in mind. Um, okay. So, um, who are we? We're Inceptive. This is our logo. Like I said, we started eight months ago. And our goal is to um, learn how to build something or create something that uh, we'd like to term biological software. So, not just you have this made-up word uh, as the title of the talk, yet another uh, kind of new or maybe made-up phrase uh, just to follow it. More specifically, we actually want to learn how to create RNA-based biological software for our cells. And now, you know, you might ans ask, okay, what, is, what could biological software be? Well, let's, let's look at something we're all familiar with, uh, namely computer software. Computer software could be seen as, you know, the end product of a process that you start by writing some code, the specification of a computer program, if you wish, and then you send that through a stack or chain of tools, maybe something like a compiler, and out comes usually a sequence of bits that make up some piece of biological software. You know, okay, if you ask Ilya, you can also put in English, but basically amounts to the same thing. And so, in our case, we want to build a process or a chain set of tools into which you can somewhat similarly uh, input specifications you know, that describe the intended behavior of a piece of biological software, and the output of this process should be RNA molecules, molecules that actually um, exhibit the desired behavior when they are inside our cells, inside human cells. Okay, so before we even, you know, try to kind of hand wavely explain uh, how we want to do this, uh, why RNA molecules? Um, you know, long, uh, for, for, for a long time, RNA was, I suppose, mostly thought of as, you know, kind of just the messenger that stands between DNA, between our genomes, and uh, the ribosome printing proteins. Um, kind of, you know, seems like it was the neglected stepchild of molecular biology for, for a long time. And that's a bit surprising when uh, you realize, um, which I only did uh, not that long ago, that only about 3% of our genomes actually describe proteins, but 90% of our genomes are transcribed into RNA. And that RNA is also not unnecessary, right? It's, it's uh, you know, this, these, these uh, parts of our genomes are not just junk DNA. Um, if, you, if you mess with them uh, in human cells, those cells die. Um, so, you know, it's a bit surprising uh, that it didn't receive much more attention, actually. Um, also, given the fact that we have about 10 times more distinct uh, kinds of RNA molecules in our bodies than we have proteins. And as a result of that, largely, we actually don't know what most of them do. We do know many things, though, that many of them do do. Um, we know that RNAs form, uh, together with proteins, the most complex biological machines that we have in our bodies. The ribosome that actually makes every single protein, as far as we know, the spliceosome. Um, they participate heavily, RNAs participate heavily in regulation of gene expression and in splicing. They can bind to small molecules or proteins. And even though viral RNAs, uh, deservedly so, have a very, very bad public image problem, and not just that at the moment, if you look at viral RNAs, uh, you see that, that they, in particular, perform a wide range of truly incredible functions. And so, very much hand wavely speaking, right, if, if proteins are kind of the standard C library of life, then maybe it makes at least some sense to think of RNAs as all the Python and all the JavaScript and maybe even all the Perl, not so sure about that, but basically as something that is, you know, maybe a little bit less robust, a little bit more fragile, um, but incredibly flexible still. Okay, so, you know, great. Biological software sounds crazy. 
uh, where do you even start? And to be clear, you know, this is not something that we intend uh, at Inceptive to do within a few years or so. This is, these are our long-term, truly long-term goals. Well, maybe we can let ourselves get inspired by where people start as they, where people start as they, as they want to learn more about, you know, how to create computer software, right? Which often, more often than not, maybe, are programs like this one. You know, a very simple, just print hello world on some screen. And so I would uh, propose that a at least somewhat analogous piece of biological software could be this. And, and this is not the code. This is the actual biological software. This is a complete description of an mRNA, an RNA molecule, or specifically an mRNA molecule. And it's one that uh, we all know about. And in fact, it's one uh, that has been running uh, at least a few times on at least many uh, cells of people in this room. So I guess you now know what it probably is. Uh, one way of, of writing this in code that is still pretty uh, concrete could be to say, oh, print this protein, followed by a long sequence of amino acids. Um, an even more compact, somewhat more abstract way of, of saying the same thing in code right, would be print a protein, and the one that you should print is the prefusion stabilized SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So the piece of biological software that we just saw is the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, mRNA COVID vaccine. And it literally is, that is the precise active ingredient of it that in your cells and in my cells three times uh, has made our cells print this, uh, print this protein. There's something funny about this, about this process, though, which is that that level of code, right, print this protein with this amino acid sequence, is actually a dramatic underspecification of the piece of biological software that came out in the end. To basically print just this protein, the highly redundant uh, code for encoding amino acid sequences in mRNAs allows for 10 to the 630th different variants of programs that all produce the same protein. But when you look at them, like in this example, at their secondary structure, so something that can be maybe be thought of as like a 2D structure-ish uh, of, of RNAs, um, and then look at this one. These are both RNAs, mRNAs, that code for the same protein, and yet they look completely different, right? The ratio of single-stranded to double-stranded RNA is completely different. But they all, you know, produce the same protein. So they code for the same protein, have very different structures, and as a result, at least partially, also very, very different properties. They produce very different amounts of that protein. The stability of the mRNA molecule themselves, uh, molecules themselves, is very, very different. So the time it takes for these mRNAs to degrade in solution or inside our cells is completely different depending on which of these 10 to the 630th you happen to choose. The immune reactions that they provoke, unwanted or wanted, uh, are also very, very different. And it's a bit, mm, maybe, a, maybe a bit overly pessimistic, but the way we select them today, our best known methods for choosing which out of these 10 to the 630th different possible programs are pretty close to heuristic. And that's despite the fact that these properties really matter for vaccines and therapeutics. The majority of the world's population today actually does not have access to any mRNA vaccine, and the reason is that they are not reachable by deep frozen cold chain logistics. You need to deep freeze these vaccines down to minus 70, minus 80 degrees for them to actually still be sufficiently intact uh, uh, when they reach the patient. And that's just not possible for, uh, you know, the, the, the vast majority of the world's population, actually. But it doesn't stop there. If you want um, uh, to cover diseases or if you want to address diseases, vaccinate against diseases that, are, uh, that require higher antibody production, then today's uh, kind of average such piece of biological software would run the risk of producing at the required doses of produ producing severe unwanted side effects. And so in, in, in a crazy sense, we actually got incredibly lucky with COVID behaving in the way it did because it, it is in the window of, uh, of, of, of protein production that we could actually get to uh, with, with the methods that we have today. And so our shorter term goals at Inceptive are actually to fix these maybe bugs, right, before adding any new features. And so, concretely and crisply, that means that we want to design mRNA with a desired amount of chemical and biological stability um, and, and usually maximized, but maybe also just a desired amount of protein expression. 
So you have to, in order to do that, you basically have to start learning how to make RNA. Um, I, I actually spent some time in the lab and, and learned it too from people who we thankfully have in, in, in our lab uh, that have done this much more often um, than me. Um, set up this lab, worked a bunch on algorithms that I will actually not go into detail uh, today, uh, and then ended up with a whole bunch of designs. And so then you need to start and test and figure out do these mRNA designs actually do something reasonable? Are they, are they any better? And for most proteins that you might code for, that's actually a pretty involved process. It's one that we by now also have somewhat spun up. Um, but there are some proteins for which this is not as difficult. And the reason it's not as difficult is because those proteins glow. So these are bioluminescent model proteins. They're not what you normally want to create uh, you know, when, you, when you make a vaccine or a therapeutic. But they have this real advantage that they're bioluminescent and that you can then actually uh, uh, have that glow measured uh, by some device and have it tell you, um, you know, whether you say increase protein reaction, uh, uh, expression or if you actually let the mRNA sit around for a little while, it tells you um, whether it's still sufficient or how, you know, how stable it is, whether uh, enough of it survived to still uh, uh, express any protein after some period of time. Okay. So what you're looking at here is actually um, a kind of a typical uh, tray um, in which we have, I think, 72 different wells, each filled with largely um, human cells, or um, embryonic liver cells, HEC263T or so, I'm told. And each of, in each of these wells, we transfected these cells with a different mRNA. Transfected, just by the way, if you ever want to learn more about interesting neologisms in biology, that one is worth looking up. Toll-like receptor is also really worth looking up, especially for German speakers. Um, but, but, but back to this. Um, more precisely, the lower left quadrant has human cells transfected with the state-of-the-art industry standard mRNAs coding for a luciferase, a bioluminescent protein derived from fireflies, exactly the nanoluciferase version of it. Um, and the upper two quadrants have two different designs uh, that algorithm Z Inceptive, uh, Inceptive created. Within each of the quadrants, column by column, we basically um, artificially, uh, uh, or we, we let these mRNAs uh, uh, degrade uh, in an artificially accelerated manner. And so roughly speaking, right, you can basically say column by column, uh, this uh, shows what would have happened. Um, you know, another two weeks later or so, while this mRNA sits around and, and waits to be injected or transfected. Okay, so usually you take this tray at this point and, oh, something I forgot, ignore that column. Welcome to the world of experimental biochemistry. There was a, a mistake that happened uh, when performing this experiment for, for the stuff in this column. You'll see in a second they were degraded too much uh, accidentally. But then what happens next is usually you take this tray and you put it into a device that is called a plate reader, and then the plate reader above each of these wells has a sensor, and that then tells you, you know, how much it glows, and from that you can basically then derive back how much protein is actually still being expressed. Except when the differences are pretty pronounced, then all you need to do is turn off the light. And so in this case, while just to be very clear, this is still really just scratching the surface and really, really early, we don't exactly uh, understand everything that's going on uh, at all quite yet. Um, but to be clear, if we could do this consistently with mRNAs that are used in vaccines and therapeutics, it, it could actually have a, a significant change in, in terms of you know, how accessible such vaccines could be um, across the globe and also allow lower doses, which in turn uh, might actually reduce the side effects uh, uh, incurred to, to a significant extent. Okay, so let's just imagine, you know, over the next few years, we managed to, to get this uh, to work consistently uh, and in a certain sense, you know, iron out the bugs in the, in, in, you know, maybe these early compilers, if you wish, of biological or for biological software. Then, you know, I mentioned earlier, then we could think of adding additional features too. So what could those look like? So one interesting additional feature could be to support uh, biological software uh, where you uh, can express recursion. And this is not kind of entirely made up. Um, there are actu actually even human trials uh, now involving self-amplifying RNA, where uh, the, the way this is done today, usually, I think always actually, is that you take a bit of viral RNA, in this case from an alpha virus, 
and you ingest the right way, concatenated, with a chunk of RNA that you've taken out of a, in quotes, typical mRNA vaccine, you glue them together in just the right way, and then what happens inside the cell is that this piece of alpha virus actually creates a, um, a replicon, the part that allows the alpha virus to replicate its uh, uh, RNA genome inside cells. Um, but instead of replicating virus, it replicates what you, uh, uh, what you shipped along with it, namely a piece of, of mRNA vaccine, which then pre presents you with an orthogonal way of effectively recursively also creating more protein by actually having more copies of your, of your vaccine molecules that you didn't have to inject because they were only formed inside uh, within your cells. Now, if you think about recursion, um, you know, there might be another ingredient that you need, uh, for, at least in order for this to feel really comfortable, um, and that's you might actually want to have some conditionals too. You might want to be able to condition on things like cell type or tissue type, um, or the presence of uh, other molecules, proteins or small molecules. Um, comes in quite handy if you want your recursions to not last forever. Um, in particular, this example here uh, for a piece of RNA or for an RNA molecule that has such conditioning function, what you're looking at is a cryo-electron micrograph or uh, tomograph, actually, of the tetrahymena ribozyme. And that ribozyme, I learned, is, is, is special and interesting for many reasons. It was the first ribosome, I think, to, to be discovered, besides other things. But one of its really miraculous features is that it has a 3D structure, so that's already kind of interesting. RNAs are not often thought of as having somewhat stable 3D structures. But also, its 3D structure has the property that it changes rapidly in the presence of certain metal ions. And only in the structure or in the conformation that it then changes into is it actually going to perform one of its functions. And so this is, again, kind of something that um, has since been observed again and again as a, a general kind of capability that would be really, really interesting to have in, in you know, a, a far future instantiation of this biological software. But we want to do this in a way that is actually somewhat different than what these examples suggest, right? We don't want to kind of Frankenstein together a piece of virus and a chunk of mRNA vaccine and then you know, try it a bunch of different ways and hope that it works out. We would actually learn, like to learn to predict these behaviors and predict them sufficiently well and sufficiently precisely and reliably that we can then use that capability to actually design for the desirous behavior, desired behaviors. Right? And so I guess this was maybe not, quite, not, not that surprising. What, where we want to get to with this is to train very large neural networks, could really be any, um, that basically ingest or are given some chunk of probably in the very beginning very, very simple uh, code, some specification of desired behavior, and that generate descriptions of RNA molecules that when they, end up in, uh, when, when, when they end up in your cells, actually exhibit the desired behavior. So what do we miss? What don't we have to do with this? And this is actually what will then hopefully uh, get us back to, to the original topic of the talk. Well, we don't have any data to train these things on, really, right? And, you know, if you look at recent successes in this general field, such as AlphaFold2, right, solving this long-standing problem of uh, protein structure prediction, uh, with a deep learning model. Um, AlphaFold2 has an interesting, a very interesting combination of data that it learns from. It learns from a small, 180,000, give or take, a set of examples of protein sequence and known 3D structure. But in addition to that, it actually learns extensively um, from data that was basically produced by evolution, by evolution refining uh, proteins over time plus the assumption that we think that these mutations of proteins should be function-preserving. Okay? Turns out, actually, a different group, not, not long after, uh, followed up this work with one where they don't need to make this assumption anymore. All they need is really all the protein sequences that we know throughout the course of evolution, and then they just run BERT on it. They call it amino BERT, basically does the same thing. Fine. Unfortunately, for designing, doesn't seem, for reasons that I, that, I, that I won't go into in, in the interest of time, it doesn't seem like that will be sufficient. Instead, I think that we will need to do something that is in between machine learning, in between deep learning and biology and biochemistry. And as a result, actually, I think is you know, at risk of, in a certain sense, not receiving the attention that it should receive um, and might even fall through the cracks. 
which is that we need to design novel experiments, wet lab experiments, that are specifically aimed and optimized for generating training data. So they have to be scalable, right? We need lots and lots and lots of training data for these uh, uh, huge neural networks. They need to, of course, observe processes that are you know, heavily moderated by RNA, otherwise it's not relevant to what we want to do, can't be relevant to what we want to do. The readouts that they produce, so the actual data that comes back from some device or some sensors or so uh, that are used in the experiment, um, the kind of data that uh, they output needs to be such that they permit efficient super supervised or self-supervised objectives. Right? If they are terabyte large, um, terabyte large micrographs, then at first, you know, we can't do anything with that, at least right, right now, hopefully soon, uh, but it'll take us a while. Um, and they also need not be uh, specialized or limited to just one single property. They really need to be such that the different flavors of behavior, of biochemical behavior and interactions that we observe implicitly are general enough to ensure that once we have enough of that kind of data, we really can train huge neural networks that pre-train huge neural networks that then implicitly learn something so general about the behavior of, in this case, RNA molecules in human cells, that we can then use them to, and, and, and with appropriate fine-tuning, actually get them to be suitable for, for designing something as complex as, as RNA sequences. As a, as a, as a slight uh, uh, detour or side note, this is actually one of the reasons why it's maybe amazing also to work on problems that are at the, in quotes, subhuman level. Right? If you work on language and you need training data that doesn't exist on the web or somewhere else that you have access to, you have exactly one choice, which is to somehow get humans to create it for you. In our case, we don't have to really get humans. We just need to get human cells to do it for us. But, of course, that you know, also presents huge challenges, and we're far, actually far, far away from mastering those. And so I think it's, it's, it's easy to understate and underestimate how different these experiments are from what is, I guess, typically conducted in biology or biochemistry. They really are not meant for discovery. They're not meant to further our understanding of life, of how life works and what the components of life are. They really are aimed squarely at improving our models for predicting tiny figments, tiny bits and pieces of life. And so as a result, you can't build them, you can't design these experiments with just biochemists or biologists or machine uh, learning researchers, right? You need all of those folks, biochemists, biologists, machine learning researchers, probably statisticians and roboticists to actually work together in, in tight-knit teams because you, you know, say the roboticists, you really want to, in order to scale these effectively, optimize and, and automate as much of these experiments as you possibly can. And as a result, not only will the experiments actually be rather different, than uh, what you typically find in biochemistry, the teams and, and you know, groups that you'll need in order to design them also will have to be very different. And so hoping that at least, you know, that I managed to at least get a bit of a flavor of what we're intending to do in the long term across, um, this might actually then, uh, you know, allow uh, at least deducing a little bit of what this concept of bioprology might be, because I don't think that what we're trying to do is really biology anymore, right? but maybe it just is kind of uh, the very early hint of, of something that could be called bioprology. That's all I have. Thank you. So let's see. Are we going to have questions this time? So thanks a lot for that. Uh Fantastic and inspiring talk, uh, Jakob. Uh, bioprology sounds like it uh, might be the next interesting area in AI research to, to truly be involved. Well, I don't know if the term is going to stick, but at least I wanted to get the idea across. <laughs> uh, well, it's, uh, it, sounds, it sounds pretty good. I like the, uh, the Latin uh, terminology to it. Um, so just to remind folks, uh, you can use the Hoover app to ask questions directly. Um, but to begin with, uh, kind of on a, a technical level, if you, can, if you can share these details, it seems that when you're designing these new RNAs, you have to manage an incredible search space yep. of potential options. Uh, how do you actually do this? Um, yeah, so, so this actually already does get pretty close to some of the really interesting details, I think. Um, and, and I can tell you a little bit more about how we want it to work. The way we want it to work, and it is because of this huge search space, is in a way or at least that's our current best bet, 
that looks a lot like, um, you know, maybe the learned optimizers in spirit of, I don't know who's read this blog post, you know, just ask for generalization, the learned optimizers therein, where basically you try to end-to-end -end learn individual steps of an optimizer. Um, we're doing that in order to avoid some of the problems that come with this huge search space uh, and some of the requirements that they actually um, oppose towards the robustness of these learned objective functions, right? If you think of combinatorial optimizers walking around in, in, in this giant space, they will discover you know, adversarial weaknesses or, or uh, issues with the robustness of, of your learned objectives. And maybe a way of working around that uh, could be such optimizers where, in a certain sense, each iteration or each step is learned end to end. Thank you. Um, I guess as a second question, you know, seeing this, this complexity and actually uh, discovering robust molecules, what do you potentially view as risks of you know, speeding up this process at, at such large scale? Um, I think the risks beyond what we're doing right now are minimal. So it's actually, in a, in a certain sense, I think it, it is, it, it's difficult to imagine how you would do worse. Uh, right? We're not talking about downstream actually avoiding any of the, of the safeguards that are in place right now. They, they will all remain in, safe, uh, in, in place and, and they will probably actually get better too over time as you know, we learn more about, uh, about the specific kind of technology. Um, but ultimately, the more targeted you are able to search, the fewer things you'll have to try that you know, then might actually have dramatic unintended consequences. And so if anything, the hope of course would be that this will allow us to try fewer not so great things. Excellent. Uh, and then uh, I guess as a more general question, seeing as you're somebody who before being in biology were in NLP, so you have kind of a broad view into uh, what's needed uh, to kind of you know, drive AI forward. Uh, earlier today, we uh, had a, a talk by Lenka Zdebarova who spoke uh, about uh, and you know, uh, cited some other AI luminaries about how AI is the fourth industrial re revolution and uh, the new electricity. Uh, and when you were talking about designing wet lab experiments specifically to generate new training data, it, it got me thinking, overall, how much of uh, society's processes, if we are to take these, these claims as true, uh, need to potentially be changed towards the idea of generating training data for, uh, for AI systems? That's an interesting question. I actually think there could be a whole lot. Um, there's, there are, of course, very reasonable concerns around letting that kind of get out of hand, around privacy, for example. Um, but if you if you want to look at things, also uh, some of the some of the <laughs> the comments that Regina made uh, in in the previous talk, right, about our friends in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, who you know may or may not share certain data with us. Um, I hope Inceptus friends from the pharmaceutical industry aren't listening too closely. But it is a bit weird that they're allowed not to share that data with us. Um, so you know I think regulation actually uh, could go a long way. Um, uh, in promoting or maybe even requiring uh, more of effectively processes that gather data to at least also uh, be engineered to also be helpful uh, for, for machine learning applications downstream, specifically in, in areas like healthcare and, and, uh, and biology, that could probably have dramatic positive consequences. Of course, again, uh, one needs to be very careful to, to keep in mind the, the potential downsides and pitfalls. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank and you. Uh, let's thank Jakob once again uh, for his fantastic talk thank and you. a great Q&A session.